Y'all, let's stand all over the building, if you would. Good to see you here this morning. This I believe. Our Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, Conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe. In the name of Jesus, our defender suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light. Forever seated high. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is free and one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Yes, 
Yes, I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Yes, I'm chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me. Not against me, I am who you say I am. Who the Son sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for I'm a child of God, yes I am, who the sun sets free, oh is free indeed, I'm a child of God, yes I am.
Amen. You can be seated if you can. I don't know if you can be seated after that. Wow. Good to see you this morning. So excited you made a choice to be here today. I want to give you, give you just a few encouraging, exciting announcements. If, if you can't tell, I'm pretty excited that uh, this coming Wednesday night, our youth are going to be in here. These guys are going to be singing like on the front row. And they're saying, no, ain't happening. You're going to be in here. Will you sing? No. <laughs> Micah and the youth are going to be in here this coming Wednesday night. It's going to be exciting. If you're not a Wednesday night regular person, come join us. It's going to be fun. They're going to be in here singing, and Micah's going to lead our worship time, our Bible study, and uh, that, that's exciting to me. Next Sunday morning, here's an important announcement. Next Sunday morning, we're going to one worship service. We'll have a 9.30 worship service. Everybody comes to the same service, say, well, how are we going to social distance? We're, we're going to have more chairs and things around the edge, and uh, it, it'll work. And, and if you have any questions, cares, or concerns about that, just see me personally. If you don't want to talk to me, talk to Brother Chuck, Brother Michael, your deacon. But no, seriously, let me, let me give you the input, the answers to what we're going to be doing. Uh, as a matter of fact, got just a little brief outline to tell you what we are going to do and also what we're not going to change so what we are changing is everybody in one service and say okay that's it so we're doing away with the 8 30 and doing away with the 10 30 9 30 in here following that sunday school for everyone you say well i don't know if i feel good about that we're going to do social distancing in here and there so what's not changing this is important we're going to continue to do social distancing as much as practical or possible. Family groups sitting together, staying together, those kind of things. And we're going to continue this everyone doing hand sanitation. Make sure, clean your hands after any kind of contact, going through doors and things like that. Matter of fact, we're going to have the coffee over there. Don't know exactly <clears throat> how we'll work out all those details, but we're going to have somebody serving that. And then if you touch anything, of course you want to clean your hands. There are dispensers all over this building, the other building. As you go upstairs to the classrooms, as you go in both doors, there's a hand sanitizer there and all of these doors, nursery wing, back door, everywhere. So <clears throat> do that. Now, if you're a person that feels like you ought to wear a mask, guess what we want you to do? Wear a mask. Nobody's going to say anything to anybody about that. But we want to practice good hygiene, social distancing, as practical as it can be. And wear a mask if you feel necessary. Um, direct family ministry things. Um, we're going to do church, Sunday school, Wednesday night. Pretty well, that's it. Indirectly, wedding showers, uh, food events, funerals, all that, those things will still be restricted because of the, the fellowship and activity of that. Uh, we are going to have the OCC thing uh, towards the end of the month, but that will be spaced out, and, and we'll give you those details later on. But we hadn't been doing any of these things. We're going to continue to video. Uh, if you've been watching some videos, great. If you hadn't, tell others about the video. There are people that need something to watch, and uh, all of our videos are recorded. They'll, we'll either produce first or second service. Continue to stay at home if you don't feel good. As a matter of fact, in the first service today, we had two or three people, not with COVID conditions, just allergy type stuff or didn't feel good, text me a couple of days ago and said, hey, I don't think I got anything, but I'm going to stay home. So we just want to be wise. Say, well... What about this? Well, what about that? Let me know and we'll talk about it. So, there you go. Um, any questions, cares, or concerns, see me or the guys. We have a document that's in the hall. It's called Safe Worship. This has been our plan, our goal, our guide the whole time. And all that talks about is the stuff that I've just mentioned. If you have any questions about this, this document's laying on the table. If you have any questions about any of that, see me. All right, a couple more things, calendar things I want to tell you about. So that's next Sunday the 11th, 9.30 in here, Sunday school to follow. Wednesday night, the 14th, Mike and them will be in here on the 7th. On the 14th, Jason Ebert will be here and uh, some other folks, and I want you to come and join this. That night, we're going to hear about Beds for Kids. It's an organization out of Columbus, uh, I can't, Dream Center, Dream Center of Columbus, uh, Dream Center of Mississippi, they build beds for children. Their children, a, a large number of children across the United States don't have their own bed. They either sleep on a couch or a pallet or a sofa or whatever. And uh, we want to help some kids in Knoxby County get those beds. And this is a ministry opportunity for us. What it looks like, just basically, 
They bring a trailer in here, a work trailer. We help them. It's a Saturday project. We'll be out here in the parking lot doing the work. And we'll provide labor and funding to cover the cost of those. They'll do the placement. We'll be able to go with them and do some of that. But anyway, it's going to be an awesome opportunity. And that is the 14th is just the information. I don't know the date we'll have the bill, but everybody needs to know about that. And I have a, even have some brochures over here if you want more details. So next thing of importance to tell you, Sunday, October the 18th, we start the service, and you're going to be excited. We start the service with believers' baptism. Isn't that fun? Amen? Then Wednesday, October 28th, OCC packing party. You'll get those details. Miss Tammy will be putting that together and giving you some public <clears throat> more details about that next Sunday and the following Sunday, the 11th and the 18th. Wow, lots of stuff going on, right? I'm so glad you're here this morning. I want to close my part of this service by doing something that I feel led to do. This morning, somewhere in the 4 to 5 o'clock hour, I saw four pastors on Fox News, and they were talking about the president and the fact that the president and, Ms. and Melania have uh, COVID. And, of course, they were talking about other people as well. We're, that's not all about them, but the president of the free world has COVID. And you know that, and I know that. And they're giving him some experimental drugs, and he's doing very well, we understand. And we trust that. But we want to come together and pray. We want to just pray over him, Melania, and all of the people across the country that might have COVID, uh, that God would heal them according to, their, to his plan. So why don't you just do this when we stand. These guys are going to come back and lead us in worship. But let's join our hearts together in prayer for our president and our nation and our time of worship. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. Asking you, Father, for your will to be accomplished in our lives. Father, we ask you for your shield of protection to continue over Calvary Baptist Church and the members of Calvary Baptist Church. God, you know every dot and tittle. You know every detail in all of our lives. You know the circumstances and situations. You know the hurts, hang-ups, and habits that go on in the family lives of Calvary. God, I pray for your shield of protection over us. All the activities, all the events we do here. God, I pray your will would be accomplished here at Calvary. Lord, I want to lift up our president, Donald J. Trump, his wife, Melania. And they're, uh, he's in the hospital uh, being monitored with COVID. And she's home at the White House. And I understand they're both doing well. And Lord, there are countless, countless other people across the world all over the United States, in the state of Mississippi, people we know. Some people have no side effects, no problems whatsoever. Others are very, very sick. Many people have lost their lives. God, you know all of this, and you're not surprised by any of that, which we'll study this morning. You're still in charge, and you are our hope. But Lord, we want to pray over our president, because we feel that is, this is a time when we should bring our hearts together. Father, I would just pray that churches all over America, Christians all over America, would come together Humble ourselves and pray, seek your face, and turn from our wicked ways. God, I pray your will would be done in the heart and life of our president and in the first lady and all of the other people, Father, that have the dreaded China virus. God, I pray your will would be done. Keep the rest of us safe that haven't received it, Father. We know we've been in contact with it. We had to have. So, Lord, I praise you and thank you for your shield of protection. Would you keep it over us, Father? Would you continue to keep us safe according to your will? That's my prayer. Father, as we come together now for more singing and a time of worship, just asking you to speak deep into our hearts. Let us receive your word. Let us apply your word. Let us today give our lives and surrender to you because you are worthy. Thank you, Father. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let's remain standing, if you would, for just a few minutes. I am resolved. I am resolved no longer to linger Charmed by the world's delight Things that are higher, things that are nobler These have eluded my sight I will hasten to him Hasten so glad and free I will come to thee I am resolved
by this world's delight, things that are higher, things that are nobler. Can you say that prayer today or say that I'm tired of this old world? As this old world gets, the older I get, the, the, I told you this before, the better heaven starts looking and the worse this old world starts looking. Charmed by the world's delights, boy, they don't bring any lasting peace. But Christ in me is the only thing that is worth anything spiritually. I can't live a spiritual life. I can't live a godly life. I can't live a Christ-centered life in and of myself because I don't have it in me. I'm, I was born in sin, conceived in sin, but Christ in me. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ that lives within me. And now, the life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is a little song we just learned. Uh, we're going to sing it, but if you as we get through it, if you kind of catch on to it, because it's not that hard, you can sing with us. But it's yet not I, but Christ in me is the name of the song. <laughs> what gift of grace is Jesus my redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is fully bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley, He will be. Oh, the night has been won, and I shall overcome, yet not I, but through Christ in me. No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon And he was raised to overthrow the grave To this I hold, my sin has been defeated Jesus now and ever is my plea Oh, the chains are released I can sing, I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Listen, with every breath I long to follow Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne to this i hold my hope is only jesus all oh, glory evermore to him and when 
when the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yes, when the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Great, great job, team. Thank you. Thank you, all of you, for being a part of that. Open your Bibles to the book of Acts. Acts, right? Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. Chapter 12. We'll be in verse 18 and verses following. Acts chapter 12. So, I know there's a few in here that have been through struggles like I have. Let me just assure you, this word this morning, to me, provides some of the most comforting, powerful, as a matter of fact, watch how God puts this together at the end, even the four points, how God puts those four points together in a comment at the end of the message. And I didn't do that. I'm just giving you what the Lord's Word says. Today's message title, Godly Lessons from an Ungodly Leader. Godly lessons from an ungodly leader. Today we come to a surprising, I'd say, and gruesome end of the story that we began last Sunday with the murder of James, the brother of John. Then there was the arrest of the apostle Peter. Peter was being held in prison by King Herod, you remember? King Herod had intentions of killing him, though. And then last week we saw the king was only waiting for the eight day, excuse me, the eight day Passover feast to end. But we saw in verses 5 through 17 something extraordinary happened. The church offered up constant prayer. I, I just wonder. I just can't help but wonder. I, I encourage you to pray for the election all from last Sunday to November 3rd. I just wonder what would happen if the church in America would pray. Would really pray and turn from their wicked ways. Would really sincerely pray and beg God. I just wonder what would happen. Well, we see evidence of what can happen because the, the church was praying. We, we saw the story last week and, and there was constant prayer on behalf of Peter and God sent an angel. Remember, the angel came and the chains fell off. And then we see in just a few minutes in the story, we see that they were leaving and then the gate flew open. And uh, Scripture doesn't tell us that an angel had a key or an angel opened the gate. Literally that the chains fell and the gate came open. It, it seems to me in just looking at this and thinking about this and going back and reflecting what we've studied, that persecution had began again in the church. I mean, you remember we studied in Acts 8 and Acts 9. Persecution had been being led by Saul, Saul of Taurus. And then Saul, of course, had his Damascus Road experience. Then you might remember in chapter 9 we studied. Chapter 9 verse 31 said that then the churches throughout all of Judea, Galilee and Samaria, had peace and were edified. After the persecution. I said before, maybe, I think I said this in the other, this morning. Does that mean that after 2020, that something great's going to happen? Peace, and, 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 and we'll be edified, and God will be glorified. Well, He can do that now. Now we're in Acts chapter 12, and the persecution is back on again. But now listen, it's important, I, I, something intentional here this morning because I'm, I, I know I'm different than you because I'm really weird about this. But sometimes when I'm just reading through the Bible every day, I forget what period of time it's talking about and how long chapters and verses and these things are. So we're in Acts chapter 12 and the persecution is back. And, and it's being led by King Herod. Now this is Herod... This Herod was Agrippa. He was the first. 
He was the grandson of King Herod the Great. King Herod the Great is the one who ordered John's head to be beheaded. Remember? And remember that story. This Herod was also the first person to rule over the same complete kingdom since his grandfather. As a matter of fact, it's now 44 A.D. Or 11 years after the crucifixion, we'll say. And the persecution of the church surrounded the death of Stephen had taken place around seven years before. So we've read 12 chapters, but literally see how much time we're talking about in reading those. So with all of that background, join me in Acts chapter 12. Let's look at verse 18 through 25 together. And then we'll jump into our lesson this morning. And verse 18 says, In the morning the soldiers were very troubled about what had happened to Peter. You might be reminded, they were troubled because they were to watch over Peter. Four, four groups of them and Peter gone. Verse 19 said, Herod looked for him but could not find him. He asked the soldiers who watched the prison about Peter. Herod said that the soldiers must be killed because Peter got away. Then Herod went down to the country of Judea and the city of Caesarea to stay for a while. Herod was very angry with the people of the cities of Tyre and Sidon. They went to him and asked for peace to be made between them and the king. They asked this because their country got food from the king's country. The people made friends with Blastus, the king's helper. A day was set aside. On that day, Herod put on purple clothes that a king wears. He sat on his throne and spoke to the people. They all started to speak with a loud voice. This is the voice of a God, a little g-god, not of a man. The angel of the Lord knocked him down, Herod, because he did not give honor to God. Then it says he was eaten by worms and died. The word of God was heard by many people and went into more places. Saul and Barnabas went back to Jerusalem after they finished their work and took John Mark with them. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would take what we've just read. Help us to hear from you, apply it to our hearts, and then respond according to what you speak into our hearts. Father, have your way in this part of our service here today. That would be my prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can I just tell you that the world, even today, is full of ungodly leaders? Matter of fact, the world is just full of ungodly people. I, I don't know if you keep up or realize it, but in the recent days since President Trump has been put in the hospital, since he was diagnosed with COVID-19, him and Melania, that on Facebook, that on Twitter, that on talk shows, that in other places, people have said, he deserves it, I hope he dies. Now, I don't know how you feel about that statement, but that makes me cringe that anyone in this room would think it, but certainly publicly state it. Because God knows what we think. But let me tell you, not, I'm not saying any of you said that, but anyone, that makes me cringe, folks. I, I don't know anybody that I would like to die. I don't know one person on this earth that I think, I wish he'd die. Do you? People are saying that. We live in an evil time. But there's good news. We live in a difficult time. A dark time. But there's good news. King Herod is a bad example or a good example of a bad king. And the Bible gives us some important lessons that we can use right here today. It's found, and it's so appropriate. The first lesson that we see in our text today, the first lesson, the first point, is that evil will always rise when God is rejected. Think about it. Evil rises when God is rejected. Evil will increase when the God of the Bible is rejected. When they reject God's ways, when they re reject God's Messiah. 
our Lord and Savior Jesus. This sad fact is so true in every level. As a matter of fact, it's true in families. It's true in individuals. It's true in governments. All societies. The first lesson here is that evil will rise when God is rejected. <coughs> this same thing happened about this point in the message on the first time. <clears throat> Straining too hard. We see this full blown. We see this full blown in the unrestrained evil displayed here in Acts chapter 12. Remember back in verse 2 we studied last Sunday. They killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And verse 3 says, And because he saw that, and it pleased the Jews, so he proceeded further to arrest Peter. You see, after God miraculously sets Peter free, we see more of Herod's heartless ways found in verse 18 in our text. Then as soon as it was day, there was a, a, a small stir. No small stir. That means it was a big hocus about this. No small stir about the soldiers about what had become of Peter. Verse 18 said, But when Herod had searched for him, Peter, and not found him, he examined the guards. He questioned them. Call the guards in. Hey guys, come here. Tell me what happened last night. And commanded that they be put to death. And he went down to Judea and Caesarea, and he stayed there. Verse 20 said, Now Herod had been very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. But they came to him with one accord. And having made Blastus the king's chamberlain their friend, the king's servant their friend, they asked for peace because the country was supplied by food from the king's country. Herod probably gave the order to kill the guards with no more compassion than just swatting a fly. Nothing. Kill these men. Probably no big deal. Herod had also cut off the much needed food to these people of Tyre and Sodom. Earthly kings can be cruel beyond measure. And they generally are, honestly. They are not living under the lordship of Christ and when they're not they are wicked. When, when they're not, they are wicked. Men who reject the God of the Bible will either set themselves up as a God or bow to some other God. Think about how horrible it must be to live in North Korea. Think about it. Most of the people there starve. Most of the people get small rations of food. While the main ruler, the madman, he lives in luxury. Think about the heartless cruelty of the radical, radical Islamists. Think about how they are. Think about the massive corruption in our own country. It's even more evidence that evil will thrive when God is rejected. You want to know what's wrong in our country? There's the answer right there. We rejected him in schools, and we rejected him, we rejected him, we rejected him. And what's happening in our world? Evil is thriving. This prejudice against Christians is just one of the many examples that we could list. All kinds of evil are thriving yet in our world today. But we must not blame God. The Lord does not allow evil to continue, but just for a time. That's what 2 Peter 3 says. It tells us it's because God is still seeking to save that which is lost. And at the right time, at the appointed time, God will bring all evil to an end, period. But until then, until then, evil will always spring up when people reject the God of the Bible. Second thing we see this morning is that God is in control. And that is good news. If you can't join me in saying amen about that, wake up. God is in control. That's our second lesson found in verses 18 and 19. Look again. Then as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers about what had become of Peter. But when Herod 
had searched for him and not found him, he examined the guards and commanded that they be put to death. And he went down to Judea of Ces- and to Caesarea and stayed there. Think about it. Think about the guards. Last week we talked, there were four battalions, four groups of guards. Man, Peter was a bad guy, I said last time. Not bad in the physical bad, but he was somebody that they thought they had the upper hand on. They thought they had him right where they wanted him. As a matter of fact, I believe Herod thought the same. But you know what happened? God is in control. God is in control. And no one can ever get the hand of A hand up on God unless he allows it. You know how I know that? Open your Bibles. Go back to Genesis chapter 32 with me. This is too good to miss. Keep your Bible marked there in Acts because you want to come back here in just a minute. Genesis 32. You remember the story? The guy's name is Jacob. Do you remember? Genesis 32. Look at verse 24 through 30. Several really good things here that make the point. Verse 24 of Genesis 32 says, Then Jacob was left alone. And a man, has your Bible got a capital man there? Has it got capital M-A-N? I believe it does. Capital man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now he, that capital, that he capital, it is, that he saw that he did not prevail against him. He touched the socket of his hip And the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. He, and he, that's God, said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. That's what Jacob said. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name, that was a capital he there. And he said, your name will no longer be called Jacob but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Verse 29 says, Then Jacob asked him, saying, Tell me your name, I pray. And he said, Why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. Verse 30 says, And Jacob called the name of this place Peniel. Peniel. For I have seen God face to face in my life's Life is preserved. As the Lord wrestled with Jacob that night, don't you know, don't you believe, don't you realize that God could have broken away from this at any time? But the Lord gave Jacob the upper hand because God wanted Jacob to get this. God wanted Jacob to get the point where Jacob would never let go of God no matter what. No one ever gets the upper hand on God unless God allows it. I I think about Jesus being willing to go to the cross for you. For you and me. Jesus died on the cross for me personally. If no one else would have been alive, He died just for me. And all of us can say that. We can see that. I, I think of Jesus being willing to die for us. Letting... Excuse me, letting puny guys like Brother Chuck and Brother Micah and me pin him down and nail him to the cross. You know, it was our sin that put him on the cross. It was your sin, it was my sin. The Almighty Son of God was put on the cross for us. But can I tell you something? With confidence, God was in control. God was in control in John chapter 10. Let me read you this. It's just four verses. Listen. Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down or gives his life for the sheep. Verse 15. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And then he says, verse 17. Therefore my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I might gain it again. Here's the key verse. This is what ties it all together. And no one takes it from me. No one takes Jesus' life. No one takes it. But I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. And I also have power to take it up. This command I receive from my Father. 
Folks, nobody, nobody gets the upper hand on God unless he gives the authority. There it is. No one has ever gotten the upper hand unless he allowed it. God is in control. Even when it looks like it's a flat out tailspin. Even when it looks like it don't make sense. Even when we don't understand. God is in control. And our lives are in the hands of God. King Herod disastrously found this out. He found out in verse 23. Look back in Acts 12. An angel of the Lord struck him. And because he did not give glory to God. You get that? You better give glory to God. The angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God. That's the statement. And he was eaten by worms and died. Now, I I just have to tell you what that looks like to me. You've had tomatoes in your garden, right? And you go out one day and you gather your tomatoes and it's a couple of days before you go back. And when you go back, all of a sudden you notice one All the leaves are gone and all the tomatoes on this one have holes in them or half eaten and and there's nothing there but a stalk. And you find that booger. He's about the size of my finger. He's he's about that long. He's green, got a little horn right there on the head. And he's eating that whole plant up and most of your tomatoes up by himself. But this says he was eaten by worms and died. I don't know what this looked like, but in my mind, i got a pretty good visual on this. He was struck down, and worms came and eat him up. And to me, I wouldn't want to be in that place. Every moment of this life that you and I have is a gift from God. And you and I must be ready right now. Right now. We must be ready. Because just like the guards, just like the king, we can leave this world in a moment. In a way we never expected. So we must be ready to stand before God. The God who reigns over the whole universe. Listen, Jesus wants you and me this morning to be ready. He died on the cross of Calvary for you, for me. He rose again on the third day from the dead. And by His Spirit, He knocks on the doors of our hearts so that we will open our hearts so that we will receive Him as our Lord and our Savior. Have you done that? Have you done that this morning? Have you done that in your life? Can I just tell you? Nothing else really matters. Everything else comes after that. Nothing else matters except giving your life to Jesus. And we must be ready because because God is in control. Third thing I see in our text this morning, third thing I see is we should always give glory to God. Always. That's a big word. Always. Not sometimes. It's easy to do. Sometimes. Always give glory to God. That's what he didn't do. Oh, maybe Herod had done it sometime, but always. And that's the third lesson. We should always give glory to God. It's found in verses 20, 21, 22, and 23. The people of Tyre and Sidon were desperate to make peace with this king. So King Herod received this delegation in Caesarea. And he made a speech during the festival dedicated to Caesar. The Jewish historian Josephus, he said... He reported that King Herod's clothes that day were made of some shiny, shimmering silver. And that the apparel that he had on, the attire that he had on as he came before the the people, in the morning sun as it hit the garment, the people were mesmerized, Josephus wrote. Look at verse 21, 22, and 23 again. So on a set day, Herod arrived or arrayed in his royal garment. He sat on his throne and gave an oration or a talk. That's what we said. And the people kept shouting the voice of God. This is the voice of God, not of man, not of the God, a God. People were shouting this. 
Then immediately the angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God. And he was eaten by the worms and died. You know what? I, I ponder over things. Y'all know. I read the Bible so crazily. And I think when I read that, I say, man, Herod, all you had to do was just say, it's not of me, folks. It's of God. And then I say, but that's all I got to do. And how many times do I miss doing that? It's not of me. It's about God. Let me tell you, this is not something to recite. This is a fact. What's happening here is not about me. Not about Brother Chuck or Brother Micah. It's not about this building, this property, these people. This is about God. And we need to acknowledge that. So Herod was killed. He found out through a high price about pride in a terrible way. And there were several important truths for us here. Uh, just a few. Let me just, let me just remind you of these. I mean, like never. There's never a good reason to worship a false god. Never. And we can, here's another one, we can never really fully depend on a earthly king. And, and let me tell you this, even best leaders, the best ones that there are, they'll, they'll let us down if we follow them. Like I said, it's not about me, Brother Chuck or Brother Micah. It's about Christ that lives in us. But the biggest lesson that I see we can learn here. The biggest lesson that I find from Herod's death is that we should always give glory to God. Always. Always give glory to God for the good things in our life. Live a life as a humble person. Live with a humble heart. As the Apostle Peter said in Galatians 6.14, God forbid. He said, God help me. God don't let me. That I should glory except in the cross of the Lord Jesus. By whom he was raised and crucified to me and I to the world. Listen, we must give glory to God always. Paul gave glory to God, especially for the cross. And we should do the same. Psalm 96 verse 7, 8, 9 says, give to the Lord. Give to the Lord. O families of the peoples, give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due to His name. Bring an offering. Come into His courts. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before Him all the earth. Always give glory to God for the good things in your life. And finally, always keep your minds on the mission. Keep your minds on the mission. What's our mission? That's the truth, the fourth truth of our lesson. As Christians, we should always be reminded our mission. You say, well, I thought that was your mission. You, the preacher. Now, I thought that was Brother Chuck's brother. No, it's the church's mission. It's the mission is to go. Go and tell. Go and share. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy It's all of our mission, all Christ followers. It's told here. Look at verse 24 and 25 back in Acts chapter 12. The word of God grew and multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry. And they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark, who we'll study more about later. More and more people, more and more people were getting involved into this ministry. Remember, we just talked about how long this had been going on. It roughly 11 years uh, from the beginning, and when we started reading Acts chapter 1, here we are in chapter 12, roughly. But the ministry was growing. And we're going to see later about Mark and how he eventually started out kind of on rocky ground, but how he worked and how he continued. But the most important mission in the world was going forward by the grace and the power of God. King Herod couldn't stop it. Can I tell you, Caesar couldn't stop it. Let me just tell you this, Satan couldn't stop it. And he's still trying to stop it even today. But the message keeps going on. You see, folks, this right here is the Word of God. This is the good news about Jesus Christ. The good news that continues to go and grow and multiply around the world. And our job is to keep our mind on the mission. Maybe you remember 
a missionary named Jim Elliott. I believe his wife's name was Elizabeth. They were missionaries in the 50s, longer than that, but in the 50s, mid-50s, 1956, in South America. They were ministering to a group of Indians. They were trying to win them to Jesus. They had inhabited with them. They learned the language, actually done some translating and stuff. There's a wonderful story there. Their story is actually told in a movie. You want to go to YouTube, you can watch it. You may have to watch it in multiple pieces. But the name of the movie is The End of the Spear. 2006 when it was out there. Jim Elliott was a passionate Christian. And he wrote many of his thoughts and prayers down. It's documented. Matter of fact, a Tuesday night when Dr. Future was teaching and he was, Brother Chuck had saying, uh, give me Jesus in the morning when I wake, you know, and all that. And Dr. Future was talking about that. He was on the floor here walking back and forth. He told about him writing a letter to God every morning. You remember that? Who remembers that? So he was doing that. And while he was doing that, I'm sitting over there and I said, oh yeah, that's the story about Jim Elliott and, and how he wrote his prayers and thoughts to God. So that's why I'm sharing this with you this morning. Except it also fits what we're talking about. He wrote his prayers. He wrote his thoughts. One of his entries that I found and, and read and marked and slipped into this this morning, Jim Elliott wrote this prayer. And he said, Father, make of me a crisis man. Make me a crisis man. Make me a man who can help people in crisis. He says, bring those I contact, I'm in contact with to a decision. To a decision. Let me not be a mile post on a single road, but make me into a fork in the road. So that men must turn one way or the other. Don't let my task just be nothing, but make what I say and do and act and respond, make it be impactful. So that when people come to this fork in the road, They'll have to make a choice to follow the Christ that I follow or to follow a man's own ways. Matter of fact, as I thought about that, I thought to myself, and this is what I'd like to close with this morning, that's the kind of man I want to be. A Jim Elliott. A guy, a guy would, would live his life compelling people to live a life that compels others to live a life. That compels others to live a life. To follow my Jesus. Folks. A life that compels other people. To put their faith and trust. In Christ. In Christ alone. This morning let me just tell you as I close. Nothing else really matters. You may think it does. But it doesn't. Nothing else matters. Now, I told you I was going to show you how God put all this together. Here's the four points in one sentence. Yes, evil will always rise when God is rejected. But Jesus is in control. So always give glory to God. And keep your mind on our mission. Father, I pray. I pray today. That we as this group, with this morning, reject evil and not reject you. I pray that this group in this room this morning would be willing this morning to humble ourselves, pray, seek your face, and turn from our wicked ways. Father, I know not what needs to be done as far as decisions here today. But I do pray whatever needs to be done, that whoever is in this room would be obedient. And that's my prayer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Won't you stand?